Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. We begin in Ukraine, where the mayor of Mariupol is painting a grim picture of the devastation his city has seen from nearly six weeks of attacks by Russian troops. This as concern is rising that Russian forces could resort to chemical weapons. Mariupol's mayor says more than 10,000 civilians have been killed in the strategic southern port city and is accusing Russian forces of blocking humanitarian convoys to conceal the carnage. He also alleges that Russian forces have brought mobile cremation equipment into Mariupol to dispose of the corpses. This comes as Western officials begin to investigate reports that Russian forces have already used chemical, wep chemical weapons in Mariupol. This has not been officially confirmed. These are uh, appalling weapons to even think about using. and The fact that they are part of the discussion is deeply sobering. It's not just the President of the United States, the President of France and our own Prime Minister have also been clear that there are weapons that simply should not be used and if they are used people will be held to account. I think it's useful. And the mayor of the northeastern Ukrainian city of Kharkiv says his city came under fierce attack earlier this week with multiple casualties including at least one child. Emergency workers battled fires as they searched for survivors following Monday's attacks in Ukraine's second largest city. Ukrainian authorities also accused Russia of planting landmines in the city. A section of the city has been cordoned off as security forces clear the landmines. Russia is increasingly focusing its assaults on an area that stretches from Kharkiv in the north to Kyrgyzstan in the south. Meantime, in his first known trip outside of Moscow since Russia invaded Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin is defiant in the face of increasing sanctions, saying his country can't be isolated. Can be isolated in the modern world, despite punishing economic sanctions. Putin spoke during a visit to a space launch facility in Russia's Far East. He also said Russia's military action in Ukraine is to ensure Russia's security and that its goals will be achieved. A Canada-wide Indigenous Water Initiative is providing youth an opportunity to tackle a water problem in their community. The program is called Indigenous Youth Potable Water Challenge. Young people can team up for $20,000 in funding. APTN's Lee Wilson has more. According to Indigenous Services Canada, there are currently 34 long-term water drinking advisories in effect in 29 communities across the country. Kimberly Brown is Simshiam a member of the Lacquilams Band in BC. She's also an advisory council looking for eight teams of Indigenous youth who want to solve problems their community may be having with their water. Um, so essentially it's just the opportunity for eight uh, communities to participate um, and solve their own water issues. Um, and it's judged by their own communities, um, not us. So it's very Indigenous led um, and Indigenous supported. The Indigenous Youth Potable Water Innovation Challenge can help teams with up to $20,000 to solve their community's water woes. The University of British Columbia's Rezo Centre, the Assembly of First Nations, and the federal government are behind the program. Kimberly Brown says the goal of the challenge is to inspire and engage youth. To create kids who want to become water treatment operators, to create Indigenous youth who want to become water engineers or scientists, um, or anything to do with public works and really uh, develop water in their own communities or maybe other Indigenous communities across Canada. The Indigenous Youth Water Challenge Program is accepting applications online. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kinemet. Federal officials tracked links between Mohawk activists and Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs last October. They feared another round of pipeline resistance could reignite widespread solidarity protests. That's according to an internal memo obtained by APTN's Brett Forrester. He joins us from Ottawa with more. So, Brett, how did you come by this document and what can you tell us about it? 
Thanks, Daryl. So this was a memo that was released under federal access to information laws, which means it's now technically a public document. Uh, it was prepared last fall for the Deputy Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, who is the top civil servant within that department. He was scheduled to meet with the Privy Council office. Now, the Privy Council is the bureaucratic arm of the Prime Minister's office in Ottawa. It has an intelligence sector that exists to advise the Prime Minister on national security issues issues. So this memo indicates some concern at a very high level about the possibility of protests escalating once again to the levels we saw in 2020. Uh, they were evidently weighing their options and bracing for that possibility. All right, so what were some of the issues that government officials were watching with concern? Well, it's hard to say uh, exactly, and I'll show you what I mean. This is a copy of the memo, and you can see right in the middle there's just a big uh, blacked-out portion of text that was redacted by government censors. Uh, but one thing I found interesting and that wasn't redacted was the third issue they were looking for, and this was, uh, quote, the relationship between Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and Mohawk Nation members. The memo goes on to claim that, quote-unquote, 40 Mohawk warriors had traveled to Wet'suwet'en territory at the invitation of hereditary chief Wass and I'm going to quote from the memo now it says certain Mohawk individuals are known to use protest opportunities to leverage support online and in the mainstream media uh, we can expect that these relationships will continue to develop to the extent that they are able to support each other's objectives so you can read into that a fairly significant degree of concern among government officials about this international indigenous solidarity that we were seeing playing out on the ground in 2021 one that began in 2020 during the solidarity blockades mm -hmm. all right so what sort of reaction have you received to this memo and, and to the story well, the document doesn't name these quote-unquote uh, certain Mohawk individuals, but it does uh, quote a social media post from Skylar Williams, who is Mohawk from Six Nations over the phone. His reaction was that this was essentially a waste of government money. Uh, he said it indicates a quote-unquote typical response from the government, which is to criminalize and spy, rather than simply deal with and address the underlying issues that uh, give rise to standoffs and resistance movements. Uh, after this story broke, the Gedimden checkpoint posted online, quote, We know they're watching us. We know they're scared. They're afraid. They are afraid because we know that we are the rightful title holders and they don't want to lose access to our land. All right, Brett. So what kind of questions does this raise about government surveillance of Indigenous activism? Well, it raises a number of questions. I think the first one should be, to what extent is it appropriate or acceptable for officials at Crown Indigenous Relations and elsewhere to be monitoring the social media feeds of activists for political purposes? Uh, on the one hand, they might say that this is open for anyone to look at, uh, and they were concerned about, you know, potentially legal activity. But if that is the case, then it's a job for police, not necessarily government uh, bureaucrats. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, First Nations are among the most spied upon people anywhere in the world. The Indian Act had surveillance really embedded into it from the start through things like the past system, ID numbers, a central registry, enfranchisement, and so on. Now, people who research modern surveillance argue that the constant presence of government surveillance, even in seemingly innocuous or mild forms like this, could have a potential chilling effect on activism. People may become more afraid to voice their opinions or engage in dissent because they're concerned the government may be watching them. Now, there's no you know, indication that that's going to happen in this case, but it is something researchers have pointed to. All right, we'll have to leave it there, Brett. Certainly appreciate all your insight into this. Thanks, Daryl. To read that memo and that story, head to our website at aptnews.ca. All right, we need to take a short break, but still to come, a new report in Alberta calls on Parks Canada to include cultural monitoring into future wildlife research. Welcome back. 
In southern Alberta, the Stony Nakoda Nation have been monitoring a bison herd newly reintroduced to Banff National Park, and it's led them to publish a report which calls on Parks Canada to include cultural monitoring into future wildlife research. Tamara Pimentel has this story. It started with 16 bison as they were reintroduced to Banff in 2017. Now over 60 are thriving and adapting to life in the Canadian Rockies for the first time in over a century. When we see them out there on the landscape and we know that they're, they really like being there, spiritually and culturally it's very important for us as Stony people to see, to see and know that. Bill Snow with the Stony uh, Nakoda yeah. Nation says since the release of the bison, Stony members have been conducting cultural monitoring and have recently published a report. Many, many studies on wildlife or vegetation or landscapes are done from a Western science view. And rarely do you see uh, an Indigenous study. The study started in September 2020 with ceremonies and elder interviews to learn about the bison before Stony Nakoda riders and Parks Canada ventured on a week-long trip by horseback to the reintroduction zone in the eastern slopes. We're not just going out there and talking to biologists and doing the same old western type of studies. We're, we're relying on our oral history, on our teachings, on our stories from elders. That's what's the new element here in looking at wildlife. Why do they behave the way that they are? Why do they gathering and traveling in certain places? So we got to understand some of that. The study revealed how the herd adds biodiversity to the landscape. The bison support other wildlife. Their droppings help to replenish and, uh, and help the soil. Their bison hair, the birds and the little critters will come and take that wool and go back to their nests and line their nests. They also propagate vegeta vegetation because all of the seedlings that get attached to them as they move around. The report calls for more cultural monitoring to be done within national parks across the country to combine Western science with traditional teachings. Snow says the community is expected to do another trip by horseback in the summer. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. February was Inuit Language Month. 65% of Nunavumiat list their Inuktitut as their first language. Our Kent Driscoll introduces, introduces us to an Inuk woman who didn't learn Inuktitut until adulthood. This from Iqaluit. Karen Kabluna didn't learn Inuktitut as a child growing up in Baker Lake, Nunavut. She was raised speaking English. That meant she couldn't understand one of the most important people in her life. My grandmother only spoke Inuktitut and we would, I would communicate as much as I could in Inuktitut and she would communicate as much as she could in English, but it was a long-term goal of mine to have an adult conversation with her. Now working and living in Iqaluit, Kabluna decided to take a full-time Inuktitut course at Piyurvik, a language training school here in Iqaluit. She started just before the pandemic hit and ended up doing some of the coursework online. Full-time Inuktitut immersion. After a year, she's fluent enough to make work presentations in Inuktitut. She's the CEO of Nunavut Tungavik, Nunavut's land claims organization. Even for an Inuit organization, some ideas don't quite translate. I don't know how to say Comptroller General. So some of my presentation to the board was a little limited. I'm not familiar with a lot of the traditional terminology, but I can certainly get by. Inuktitut resources in Nunavut are mostly geared towards children. Adults have to deal with that gap and end up having to use course materials designed for children. That's a lot of C. Jane run. For Kabluna, the reward for the hard work was a better sense of who she is. Learning Inuktitut for me was, it was as much about learning a language as it was about reclaiming my identity. So it was emotionally very uh, intense to present. Speaking to adults in general, it's a lot of joy that I can finally do this. It's a lot of intimidation. It's a lot of 
sadness that I'm an adult before I could do this. Inuit Language Month continues throughout February, but there's never a bad time to speak Inuktitut in Nunavut. 77% of all Nunavut say they can carry on a conversation in Inuktitut. Now Kabluna can too. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Akaluit. We need to step aside for one more break. More stories coming up. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Our very own Sarah Connors of the Whitehorse News Bureau sent in this picture of Lily. Lily is a hairless cat and apparently loves to get into trouble. Your photos can be sent by email to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. In Alberta, Cree youth in Wabasca spent a weekend on the land learning how to trap, but it will take more than traditional teachings to one day take over their family trap lines. Tamara Pimentel was lucky to go out with them. Here's her report. Even these big boys. Seth OJ is a certified junior trapper. This is still learning. Once I have the money, I'll go buy some traps and start chopping some wooden. As the trapping season comes to an end in Wabasca, Alberta, Oshie joins six other youth in a camp funded by Alberta Health Services honoring life. A weekend full of sledding, setting and checking traps, and harvesting furs, getting these teens out on the land and learning the basics from trapper Bobby Beaver. And we're trying to get as many youth back on the land, not only for trapping, but to practice our inherent rights. Because I'm going like this. And there's so many youth that, have, that are lost in their ways right now. And one of the best ways is to connect with the land. For me, that's my happy place. But to become certified like OJ and Beaver, the youth have to take a course through the province, the Alberta Trappers Education Program. It became mandatory in 2014 to ensure furs are harvested using humane trapping methods. Beaver is an instructor and works with the Treaty 8 Trappers Association, which encourages youth to get involved. He says this camp only gives a rundown of what the three-day course looks like. Eventually, you, if you have enough years experience, I think bio, some of the biologists are pushing three years of trapping experience, and then you can then you could take over your family trap line. A common goal many here hope to accomplish. If that's something that I do, then I'll be able to probably put my name as the junior on my grandpa's trap line. Well, right now it's just my Muslim and my dad, and then it would be me. So far, three have signed up for the program. Alanis Yellowney and Chevy Young are two of them. It's kind of a, a dying art, let's say, like a lot of things. And being able to have more people to know about it is good for preservation of knowledge. Kinda keeps the trap line in the family and if someone wants to try to take it, well they can't because there's another generation that's gonna come up and take over. According to the province of Alberta, if an indigenous owned trap line is not being used, the government would work with the affiliated nation to find a new owner. It's all about new traps, new regulations we have to follow. And I totally agree with that because we, we respect the animals we trap, we respect the land, and, and the humane ways is the only way to go. On day two, teachings from a local elder, lessons on setting lynx snares, and how to properly harvest furs, including OJ's catch of the season. And I have some uh, wolf bait stations out there. That's what I'm going for right now. Soon, OJ will be able to take over his Mushum's trap line and continue sharing his knowledge so others can do the same. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Wabasca. It wasn't just delegates on the trip to Rome earlier this month who felt something about the visit and the Pope's apology. A Saskatchewan Métis singer-songwriter whose grandfather was a residential school survivor said the meetings in Rome keep history alive. Here's Leanne Sanders with that story. He couldn't say his prayers cause they weren't like theirs. He'd speak his native tongue, they'd say, listen here, son. 
You're just an Indian boy. Released during the pandemic, Burke Jodwin's Indian Boy song is deeply personal. It's about his late grandfather's experiences in the Catholic residential school at Onion Lake, Saskatchewan. Asked what his grandfather would think of last week's meeting with the Pope. The odd thing with my grandfather, he was one of the most devout Catholics I've ever met. Oh, it just confused me. If, if they did to me what they did to him, I would, I would like to think that I wouldn't be a devout Catholic. But I didn't go through what he went through. You know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't tore down and, and reprogrammed. Growing up in northern Saskatchewan, Jodwin felt he never quite belonged. He says the indigenous people on the reserve didn't accept him, and the white people in his hometown of Pierceland considered him indigenous and nothing was ever taught about residential schools in his junior high school years. I sure heard about Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue, but I never heard about this eradication of a culture, and, and that's that's an atrocity in itself. Jodwin says the good thing about the meetings in Rome is they keep what happened at the residential schools in the Canadian consciousness. Um, the one thing about history is if you if you bury it, it's going to happen again in one form or the other. So these things did happen, and as long as we acknowledge they happened and and you know make sure we do something about it going forward, it won't happen again. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. With restrictions being loosened across the country, many are looking ahead to traveling once again. On a recent episode of In Focus, Melissa Ridgen talked to Indigenous tour operators across the country to give, to give you some vacation ideas this summer and how Indigenous tourism is growing in leaps and bounds. Here's some highlights from our February 9th, 2022 show, which we'll repeat tonight right after the show. And yeah, there's several hundred across this, this country of indigenous owned businesses, right? Uh, whether they're Métis, First Nation or Inuit. The, the reality is what we want our indigenous communities and your viewership to know as well as the rest of the world is that we have some amazing ways that, that indigenous culture is shared regardless, regardless of which community it's from. It's done authentically. It's done in, you know, obviously to support local jobs in the community. And more than ever, we need support. I mean, the pandemic is, I think you mentioned that the outset has been really difficult for our businesses. Uh, many of our businesses were the hardest, the hardest hit within tourism because a lot of our previous customers uh, prior to the pandemic hitting in 2019 were international. So now more than ever, we want Indigenous people, non-Indigenous Canadians to uh, try and think about another way of, uh, you know, uh, learning about this country. And I, and I, you know. And so within the cultural center really comprises of, of, of three spots. We've got the art design gift shop and also the heritage path where the tours are giving and the cultural center which exposes um, uh, significant items and artifacts and stories uh, that are contained within the center itself. It took three years to get to the open point, um, and we were really starting to take off pre-COVID, and of course COVID hit, and uh, that, that knocked a little bit of wind out of our sails, but proved to be uh, a great opportunity for New Brunswickers to connect with First Nations and to learn more about the true history of Canada and to learn about uh, the culture. That's all we have for you tonight on APTN National News. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us and have a great night.